Thank you very much for talking to me and congratulations on Judy and Punch. It's a really Thank great you. film. Um, Mira, can I ask you, what was it that drew you to the topic of Punch and Judy? Well, actually, Vice in America drew me to the topic because they had, um, I had a relationship with them. I made some um, short films that they'd bought for their online short film platform. Mm -hmm. And we'd been talking about maybe a, uh, a feature project that we could develop together. And then Danny Gabay and Eddie Moretti from the Vice office pulled me into their office one day and said, look, we, we want to make a live action Punch and Judy movie and we're interested to know whether you want to be essentially like a gun for hire writer on, mm -hmm. on this project. And I said yes and, um, and spent a long time trying to crack it open and figure out what it was and they gave me a lot of creative leeway and um, were very sort of supportive of that process. And, um, and then uh, I, I didn't know whether they wanted me to direct it or not. I assumed that probably they didn't and then they they made it clear that they did, and I re realised that I'd written myself a stupidly ambitious first film <laughs> and I had to figure out how to make it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was brilliant. Like, I, I assumed it was something that you'd come to them with. Yeah, yeah, no, it wasn't. It's normally the case, I think, for a first film, but yeah. this one was the other way around. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, and Mia, what did you know about Punch and Judy? I was aware of it, but I'd never actually seen a Punch and Judy, but I knew the content of it. I don't actually know how, like maybe just through pop popular culture, but um, yeah, so I did know about it, but I've never, I've never seen a show. I think that seems to be the, the case for like most people. I've never seen a show either, yeah. but I just, I know it. Like if someone says Punch and Judy, I'll be like, oh yeah, yeah. Mm. I know what that is. It's a bit mm. of a worry if, if people have seen it, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know, you shouldn't yeah. be showing it anymore. And um, this kind of leads on to the next question I was going to ask you, Mira, which is that the the context and all the detail of Punch and Judy is in the film. I mean, you've got the violence, the character names, Toby the dog. Mm -hmm. um, when did you decide that you kind of wanted to put the show in the film as well as tell a narrative? I was fairly early on. I mean, I, I kind of tooled around with a whole bunch of different versions of how we could tell a story or what it wanted to be or what we wanted to say with it. Um, and I think when I decided to take it back to a period piece that sort of... Um, um, it worked with when when the puppets were marionettes, and and um, it became like a sort of fictionalized origin story. That's when I thought, oh, it'd be great to create um, a, a very meta world where you have all of these stock characters existing. These guys are, um, are, are real life puppeteers, so you get to see the puppets within the stage. You get to see Judy and Punch um, within the film, and you know, I, I, I sort of like that idea of threading all of those mm. things through. So, Mia, you obviously work with Damon Harriman mm -hmm. playing punch mm -hmm. what was that like so obviously it's a very difficult relationship between the characters yeah it was really good we've actually we've actually worked together on a short film 10 years oh, earlier really? oh. yeah it was probably one of like my first ever short films mm -hmm. um and so I had known him and I'd known him just through the industry but um he's such a lovely guy he's really obviously very different to punch and mm -hmm. especially when you're dealing with all that um, stuff and a lot of violence and, and those kind of heavy scenes. It's so nice to have somebody that you just trust and felt like a real kind of um, partner in yeah in the in the whole process. Mm. And with the character of Judy as well, I'd be really interested to know how you felt because she goes on a journey. Mm. Obviously, she's very gentle and loving, and then kind of goes on this big retributive mm. journey. Um, how do you think the town of Seaside kind of plays into that? Because there's a lot of suspicion of essentially talented women. Yeah, well, for sure. I mean, and you also hear that sort of story about her, which gives you a bit of a background around her whole relationship and being swept up with Punch and going on tour and then him kind of ruining the whole thing and them having to come back. And so there is this sort of sense that they've kind of come back a bit sheepish and um, had to kind of pick up from where they left off. But you know, that things are looking up and then and then they aren't. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's definitely, I mean, I love the speech at the end when she talks about like, today the witch is me and tomorrow it might be you. Um, and you just, I feel like you just see that everywhere in the world. You see mm. that constantly. And that's sort of what I loved about this film is that it's just a reminder to sort of um, check what you're maybe thinking is really different to you or really scary and, and reassess if it's, you know, actually something to be scared of. Yeah, and without spoilers, the ending is really satisfying <laughs> as well. Yeah, it is. It is a very clever ending. It's very neat, kind of wraps. Like, I think the whole film, it just kind of, by the end of it, like, oh, this all comes together mm. really, really well. And mm. you feel like, oh, I now know about 
the show. I know about Han- Punch and Judy, but I've also got this really satisfying story going on. Yeah. Um, so my final question would be, I want to talk to you, Mira, about like the music choices, because mm-hmm. they're really cool and kind of edgy and anachronistic. Mm. When did you sort of decide to put that in the process? Because, I mean, the opening scene, for example, is um, like one of the most exciting opening scenes I've seen in a really long yeah, time. Oh, good. <laughs> I mean, that is the genius of Frank Titas, my composer. We worked together really closely, but Frank came at the project with such a like delightful um, energy and kind of madness and reckless abandon and all the things that I wanted the film to be. He, his, he suggested musically and we'd been working in the edit with a lot of temp score that never felt quite right. We knew we wanted our, our, our score to feel as, as bold and weird and original as the movie but um, we could never quite find the right sort of balance. And some of the some of the songs that are in the film we had from fairly early on, but then Frank started to sort of write this stuff that felt so magical and weird. And he talked a lot about like um, coming at it from like a stadium crowd type thing. So in that very first opening scene, you hear these sort of almost cheers from audience and mm-hmm. whoops of, mm-hmm. of elation. And he just built this sound that was so beautiful. He's really great with melody as well. He's um, I, he just his his work on the movie and he had he, he had so many cues to do in such a short space of time. It was very quick and you know um, and he exceeded all of my expectations with it. And I just felt like it it brought everything together in such a um, cohesive way. Yeah, I, I'm so happy with the music. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> it's really incredible.